Hi, this is Jim T. Chong, the walk star, and you are watching another version of The Power of Jim, and I'm with the incredible Jim Meyer from Remax Gold, and I can't tell you how excited I am to be interviewing our good friend from Caliber Home Loans, and he is Doug Pine. <laughs> awesome. Doug, yeah. thank you for joining us today. Uh it looks like you're outside. Uh, you are uh, in Vacaville, California right now. I'm in Fairfield. And our good buddy Jim is in Elk Grove. Am I right, Jim? You're, you're absolutely right. And I want to mention, I'm specifically um, excited about uh, this show because I love it when we're talking directly about money. Um, and I know, Jim, you are uh, just uh, great with real estate. And I know that uh, uh, Caliber Home Loans has been able to do some some incredible things, it really almost like magic for you here, right? And, uh, you know, I'm I, I, I'm excited just to hear uh, the situation here. Of course, I'm licensed. I deal also with money strategies as well. But uh, Jim, you know, I, I know you've been working with Doug for a while. And so uh, I'll go ahead and let you get a chance to uh, take the helm and have the power of the mic here as we start off here. Okay. Well, if you're, if you've got a boatload of money to, to invest, of course you want Jim T. Chong to help you do that. But what's the one biggest investment you're ever going to make? It's your home. And so you want to have. I thought you were going to say it's your wife, but that's okay. That's, that's okay. It's your home. It's an we'll emotional investment. And um, it uh, sometimes requires a lot of therapy to fix. Um, but anyway, the point is, mm -hmm. uh, Doug, if, if you don't get the right loan, uh, you might think you got a great price on the house. But if you don't have a good lender, um, you could be really hurting yourself down the line. So my question to Doug is, what's um, today? Um, you're doing a lot of uh, financing of uh, people's purchase. You're helping them purchase homes. Um, you're helping them refinance. But uh, I think one big question that everybody has is, what is forbearance? That's a great question, Jim. Forbearance um, is pretty popular right now, um, but um, there's some pros and there's some cons, and I think the cons outweigh the pros. Um, uh, forbearance is where the lender gives you a reprieve for a certain amount of time, and then they, uh, then they ask for repayment. They can spread the payment out, or they can uh, put it at the end of the loan, it all depends on how that particular lender that you're working with has it set up. But uh, the cons is that it can affect your, uh, it can affect your credit. Uh, so be very careful before you do a forbearance. Uh, check with your lender to, and maybe even get it in writing that uh, they're not going to affect your credit with the credit bureaus if down the line you're going to refinance and pull cash out of your house or if you're going to sell your house and downsize or move up in a, in a bigger house, let's say, you, you know, a year or two from now, your family's too big to live in the house that they're currently in and you want to buy a new house and unbeknownst to you, nobody gave you this education, but the new lender pulls your credit and finds out you have a forbearance and now they won't lend to you. So be really, really careful with the lender that you have now and get it in writing that it will not affect your credit. Oh, wow. So I, I heard you guys are getting calls off the hook about forbearance. So um, am I hearing this right, that if, if somebody is thinking about forbearance, they should probably go a different route, like uh, borrow uh, the mortgage payment from grandma before they sign some sort of deal with the bank uh, to do forbearance? Yes, yes, for sure. Uh, call your lender, get it in writing, because the last thing you want to do is have good credit and mess it up because um, it'll hurt you going right. forward. And uh, so uh, do you have a, a prediction as far as with the coronavirus and everything that's going on? What uh, down the road, if somebody's looking to, to buy a house, they're about getting qualified and is thinking, ah, maybe I should just rent. What would you say to them? Well, I would say that's probably a bad decision and I'll give you some examples why. Uh, in the present, as of today, there's a lot of people on the fence waiting to get back in. A lot of them are scared, which is very understandable. But a lot of times, um, 
uh, it might not be the best decision because right now would probably be a really good time to buy because you're not going up as much competition, right? When right. things turn around, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in this conversation. But uh, now, in my opinion, is a good time to buy. The interest rates are really good. I mean, they're really good. Um, and you have less competition. And when I mean less competition, there's less buyers because a lot of buyers are on the fence, meaning that they're scared to get in and purchase a home. So when you go to put an offer in with you, your, your, your buyer goes to put an offer in with you. They have less competition to compete. So that means that their offer is probably going to get <clears throat> accepted a lot easier today than it will when the market turns around. And now you're competing against 10, 15 buyers again, because then you're going to go over the asking price, right? Absolutely. And, and one thing that a lot of people don't think about when they're going to buy a house is they, they go online and they say, oh, uh, I want to buy this house. Uh, and oh, this is the down payment I'll have to come up with. And then they forget until they talk to you or me uh, to think about closing costs. And traditionally, in the last few years, it's been very difficult for us to get sellers to contribute to the buyer's closing costs. And today, it's much, much easier. Why? Absolutely. Because people that have their house on the market, they, they want to get it sold. And uh, if they're going to give away maybe 3% to help the buyer get in with their close, to help pay the buyer's closing costs, it's much better than them uh, conceivably sitting, letting the house sit on the market for another three months, paying that mortgage and maybe not getting to where they wanted to go, which one thing is uh, moving down, which is something I think you'd like to talk about is uh, you've got a $600,000 house, you wanna sell that and then buy, um, or, or excuse me, there's moving down, but there's also moving up. That's I was going to say right now, it's a good time to actually move up because uh, say sell, selling a $400,000 house uh, is much, much easier than selling a seven or $800,000 house. So you go, right. you want to buy that $700,000 house. Who's to say you can't get it for six fifty? dollars and you're selling your $400,000 house. Who's to say you can't sell that really fast because right now with the interest rates low, so low, people are getting in. And they're paying less for their mortgage payment than they are for their rent. And so they come to you, they get qualified. And what would you tell them? Well, I'll tell you something that some people are taking advantage of right now. Let's say you're getting ready to retire. Your kids are all, you know, out of college and, you know, on their own lives. And so you don't need that 3,500 square foot house no more. So you might want to move down to 1,500 square feet or 1,700 square feet. Well, <clears throat> a lot of people, you know, they have their 401ks, and that's great. But some people don't have 401ks, 401ks. So let's say that they want to come to you and they say, hey, Jim, we want to sell our house and we want to downsize. And you say, okay, do you have down payment money for the downsized house? And they say, well, no, not really, but we have a lot of equity in their house. Well, a lot of sellers aren't taking offers from people that live in houses now on a contingent sale. So they have all this equity in their house. So what a lot of people are doing now, especially with the times being the way they have been, is they, they go ahead and refinance. They know how much money they need to pull out. We run the numbers for them. They put that money in the bank. You go find them another house. They take that cash from the refinance. They put it down on their new house. They have you list their house that they pulled the money out of, and then they pay those loans off and they're in their house and they don't have to worry about competing with people that have a cash down payment. Um, they're the people with the cash down payment. Right. It is very difficult uh, even today to get somebody uh, excited about accepting your offer if your offer is contingent on selling your house. It's yes. actually worse than it had been for a while. Because yes. we always knew that your house was going to sell. Now, uh, especially if it is one of those more expensive houses and you're moving down, then if people get a little bit scared that that house might never sell. You take your house off the market to sell to so-and-so who has to sell their house. So instead, that you go to Doug, they pull the cash out, 
They've got the money in the bank to make the down payment. And then also just the whole moving process is much easier too. Yes. You schedule things much better uh, if you're doing these one step at a time and you're doing it in a smart way and you're not under so much pressure because uh, you can be pressured into doing something you didn't want to do, especially if, say, you know, most buyers are really nice, decent people, but let's just say a buyer is a little devious and they, they've they got 17 days for inspections and on seven, day 17, they say, oh, yeah, I changed my mind. I do want you to replace the roof or we've got no, no deal and you've got all these other things going and your life is going to be totally screwed up if you don't replace that roof. Well, yep. with Doug's plan, uh, things are a little bit different because you are in control. Uh, with and, and so, how what would they do? do? They can't come in and see you anymore. Am I right? Um, they they uh, well, our policy at Caliber Home Loans right now is yeah, we're pretty closed office, but with our technology, they've spent millions of dollars on it. We can talk to them over the phone. We can do a Zoom meeting like we're doing right now. Um, all the documentation can be sent to us. We can uh, do a Zoom meeting and show you all the numbers, run you all different scenarios. So really, you don't really need to have to come in with our technology. Right. And you don't have to worry about getting the virus, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, the only thing you can get is a computer virus through Zoom, but I don't think it has yet. Uh, well, hey, I want to interject a question here. With everything that's going on, obviously, um, it's changing the way we're, we're doing things, especially in this in this arena here. I know in yes. the financial arena, it's hard for me to, to visit anyone. So doing a lot of education, you know, over the internet here. Now, with the climate the way it is right now, what do you foresee will be happening? Because I know we do, do go through cycles. And what do you see where we're at with, uh, you know, purchasing a home today? Uh, is it going to be you are saying, of course, it's going to be easier than later, although what kind of residual effects uh, it, uh, is the current situation going to have for future purchases as well, and plus dealing with the recession and other sort of aspects here? Any comments Okay, on that? those are great questions. Um, well, first of all, you have to ask yourself, do you think that your company is going to furlough you, you know, or lay you off from your job? So if you think that that might happen to you in the future, again, you know, a refinance and pulling some cash out, especially if you're a younger uh, uh, homeowner now or married homeowners uh, and you don't want to dig into your 401k savings to purchase another home, you know, especially with the stock being down, like I was saying earlier to Jim, a lot of people are pulling some money out not to go buy a new boat, not to buy a new motor home, none of that but they're disciplined and they're putting in an, into an account. And then the second part is, I think the economy is going to come roaring back in the, in the fourth quarter of this year. I really do. Uh, the government just keeps throwing money um, in all different areas to make sure that, uh, uh, that we don't go into a big recession. And the other part of it is the reason that things failed in 2008 and we had the big housing crash was be keep, uh, I call them Harlem Globetrotter loans. People that made $1,200 a month, uh, lenders could put down that they made $20,000 a month and they could buy the big mansion in the sky. But when they hit the deferred interest uh, and it tapped out, you know, whatever that contract was, 110% of the equity or, uh, or the principal balance or 115 or 125%, then they had to make the full payment and they had to by law amortize that loan for whatever the term of the loan was and so their loans uh their payments every month uh tripled and they couldn't afford to make those payments no more well one of the things that we learned after the 08 crash was now everybody that's in their homes now all got in there legally and they had to prove their income so everybody that's in their house can afford their house right they didn't get in with those harlem globetrotter loans so that's not going to be a housing crash this go around because of those reasons. Yeah, uh, that's, so I think this is great. really important to understand this aspect because, um, you know, they had those ninja loans, right? The mm -hmm. no income, no job, no asset. And yes. um, oh my gosh, when we did loans like that, they didn't really work very well. I'm um, right. surprised, right? So right. 
um, it is really important, I think, in this this economic situation. We keep our heads in, in all situations, but we're really paying attention to what the bigger picture is. And I think through this pandemic, we're all learning how we all have to do our part. We really have to be yes. mindful and not take advantage of the situation. That's what we're learning here. You know, we're wearing masks. It's not just about us, but it's about other people as well. Even this whole thing, we will suffer the repercussions if we're not doing things correctly. So I yes. think this economy right now is really, it's really important to understand uh, that whole aspect. And, um, you know, I think on the lending side, it's, it's really important to, to really uh, see how, how, you know, how the lenders are really faring and how they're doing business, you know, and it's really good to see that we've learned a lot from the past, basically. So. Yeah. And the other thing I might interject here, if I may, um, the forbearances are actually going to hurt a lot of lenders. You'll probably see a lot of lenders actually go out of business with these forbearance because uh, especially the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac uh, purchases, um, they're expecting the servicers to absorb um, those uh, those forbearance costs. And uh, the investor that they sell them to, they have what's called calls. So they're expecting a lot. They can on they can call up a lender the next day and say, hey, we're calling that loan. You have to pay it in full with us. Some lenders have, I've heard have paid up to $50 million in uh, in one month. And then um, defaults, you know, buy back. They're called buybacks. Uh, the people that uh, quit making their house payments, they go into what's called um, a buyback uh, from the investor. And those lenders can absorb those fees. So those forbearances are actually hurting everybody. So what a lot of lenders have done to save face is they've tightened up their guidelines right now, or they've actually raised their interest rates to everybody a little bit. So they still stay legal, but they can save face and not say that, hey, we can't fund your loan. They're just taking the lower uh tier of buyers and making their uh, either their credit scores lower out of the gate or adding more stips to that loan to be able to fund them. So a lot of people are finding out that they're not getting approved like they were before this pandemic hit. So uh, one of the things with us is we're a direct lender and we're very financially sound. We had some really, re we do have some really, really smart people that foresee uh, things in the future, they plan for all the worst. And um, we're actually, we we are still, our interest rates are the same. And being a direct lender with Fannie Freddie, we, whatever their approval says from Fannie or Freddie Mac, which is a, a, a quasi lender um, backed by the government, um, they propped them up out of the 2008 mess. We still fund those loans without uh, having to jump through a lot of, uh, extra hurdles that the lenders are putting on those loans for the buyers. I don't that's know if that makes sense to you, but uh, that's going on right now. In, in a nutshell, if, if I go <laughs> get to qualify for a loan, I might be told by so-and-so I need a credit score of whatever. I come to you and you're still going to have the older qualifications mm -hmm. and have a lower credit score, a different debt to income ratio, and I might be able to qualify with you where I might not be able to qualify with somebody else, correct? Our qualified, absolutely. Our qualified guidelines are exactly the same today as they were prior to this uh, 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 coronavirus 19. And you're not so, up your rates to cover for losses. And we don't lower credit scores. Okay. So if you were to pull your credit, whatever your credit uh, uh, position was, prior to the coronavirus 19. And if your credit's the exactly same status, meaning you don't have any 30 day lates, if they were exactly the same, you know, apple to apple, then your credit score is gonna be the same today as it was prior to the coronavirus uh, problem with us. Right. And then we're not gonna say, instead of three months worth of pay stubs, we're gonna need four pay stubs, or we're not gonna say, you know, we're not going to make it harder on the buyer to get a loan so that we don't have to fund the loan because a lot of lenders, because of this coronavirus, what it's happened is the government, there's an analogy I always give when you hop in the shower in the morning, you turn it on hot, right? And yeah. then you feel it and it gets hot and then you add cold back in. Well, that's what the government did. 
they turned the hot water on and they jumped in and they bought a bunch of, it's an acronym, MBS, which is mortgage-backed securities. They bought billions of dollars worth of mortgage-backed securities and it actually hurt uh, the, the lending arena. That actually hurt. And so they had to go back and educate the government and the treasury. Right. The government did something that hurt the American people. Mm-hmm. Surprise, surprise. Surprise. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, so you now know, you... they're starting to add the cold mm-hmm. water back in, right? They're not buying as many as those mortgage-backed securities, which is a good thing. Yeah. Sure. Well, I want to ask you with everything that's going on right now, I mean, of course, everyone wants to be able to be qualified. And I hope that people are, are uh, really uh, cautious about loans that are given to you too quickly, or if they do reduce that, because the bottom line is if you can't pay it back, uh, you may end up paying the piper back later. And so, um, you know, what sort of loans do you recommend people stay away from? Are there any that you're you're just saying, wow, these are not really great loans, like the adjustable arms, you know, depending on when they're implemented, there, there, there needs to be really good knowledge before you go into a vehicle like that, right? Are there some loans that people should consider staying away from in general? Um, Just what are your thoughts on that? Well, I've been lending for a long time. I got into lending in late 93. I was uh, uh, doing home loans through the CFL, which is uh, an acronym for uh, consumer finance lending. It wasn't through the Department of Real Estate. Uh, So they had, California had two different lending organizations entities you could you could uh get licensed through the cfl or you could get licensed through the dre i chose the cfl when i first got in the business and then after i did that for a couple years i broke out on my own i studied through the dre and got my broker's license through the dre and back in those days the people that used mostly adjustable rate mortgage were investors let's say they knew that they were going to go in and buy a flip right they were going to go in and buy a house They wanted to get the lowest short-term interest rate they could possibly get while they did those fix-up costs, and then they put it out to market. They sold that house, and they went on to their next one. Well, then then they came out with the Harlem Globetrotter loans, which gave people four different choices. They could do um, interest-only payment. They could do an adjustable rate mortgage. They could do a 15-year payment. They could do a 30-year payment, but whatever which one they chose, if they chose a no interest rate, what they did was the lenders would roll that interest rate that they didn't pay or the principal onto the backside of the loan and the loan principal grew, right? Well, then when the loan grew by law, whatever that particular loan, if it grew to 110% of the original loan balance, they could no longer make uh, door number four. They couldn't make the interest only payment plus if they did that for three years, then and by law, those have to amortize. Amortize meaning it has to pay off whatever the original contract was. So let's say they did a 30 year loan, but they did those interest only payments for three years. Now they had to pay the full payment plus the principal balance and they had to pay it off now in three years less so that it paid off at the 30 year term and people couldn't afford them. So those loans really helped out investors that were buying homes that could keep the interest rates down on a short term so that they could, you know, fix it up, take it to market and move on to the next home. So uh, depending on how how uh, the bond market's doing, you know, loans do this. Right. And so do interest rates. So you got to be really careful of getting an interest only loan because it depends if you. You know, you might have a low interest rate today, but those can change daily. And then if the the short term rates like right now, it's you can get a, a interest only loan probably pretty good because, you know, the Fed dropped the rate almost to zero to help us get through this. But what happens when that interest rate start eking up again? Well, then their payment's going to go up. So it, it's all about timing and it all depends on are you buying at the height of the market with that type of loan? Are you buying at the downside of the market where, you know, you you feel like you're going to make more equity so it's worth it because you know you're going to get a pay raise in a year or two years or three years, you know, um, there every every situation is different for every buyer. So you have to sit down and really discuss. um, It's like 
the difference between going to a regular doctor and going to a heart specialist. You know, do you want to go to a regular doctor that has a license for a heart problem, or do you want to go to a heart specialist and talk to somebody that's a that's um, an expert on what to advise you on? Because you know, you could be cutting your lawn at your house, right? And your neighbor hollers across the fence on a Saturday and says, "Hey, I just got a." a two and a half percent interest rate. And so that's in their mind, but what he did for his situation might not be the best for their situation. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things where I know we're about ready to wind down here and uh, uh, Jim, I think this has been a great discussion, Doug. I, I love your expert advice here. And uh, Jim, you know, I know you have some thoughts on a lot of the stuff that was uh, uh, shared. And so if you can go ahead and just summarize just kind of the plan of action people should be considering in this economy. Well, the, to summarize, it, it, it's much more complicated than it looks uh, on an advertisement on Google. Uh, and so that's why you want to get an expert like Doug and his team. And the nice thing about uh, Doug and the people in his office is that they all listen and they hear what your situation is. And even though it's all remote now, uh, it is still better dealing with somebody local like Doug than to go and go with somebody that's, that you found online that's in Texas or whatever who's going to just type in some information, come up with some numbers. Doug is going to talk to you as if he's, he's, you know, as if it was his own house that he was buying. And Absolutely. Uh, because one of these days he might run into you at the Safeway and he doesn't <laughs> want to have to hide. So uh, yes. my suggestion would be uh, get the, get all the info from Doug and his people. And I think you're going to be happy. You know, I think this is, so I guess I guess Guido is out. If you have somebody named Guido or somebody, that's, well, hey, I got a loan for you here. Just give me a call. <laughs> no, but uh, but you know, um, uh, you know, one of the things that you want to consider out there, you know, you really want to plan carefully. You want to, as Jim emphasized, uh, work with the people that understand what it's all about. I mean, it's really interesting, Jim. I talk to people; uh, they are looking at uh, their money or buying a house. You know, for me, it's it's more the the strategic planning of their money for the future for you. I'm sure it's buying a house. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, sister Susan or, or uncle Vern, who is very well intentioned, they are now the expert. No, you know, you got to look at this, this, and this, <laughs> and you know, um, they themselves are trying to figure out, uh, what, what's going on, but you want, you want to really consult the experts. That's really the, the bottom line, especially in this economy. And you don't want to have shortcuts. Remember if there are too many shortcuts taken, probably something's going to come back and, um, and get you in the end. So Doug, do you have any final things you want to share with people as they're thinking about, you know, getting a home or they're thinking about the lender they should choose? What are your thoughts here? Well, go with what your gut tells you, you know, um, call a few lenders, you know, do whatever you want to do. We're very educational. So if, if they have any types of questions, whether they think they're silly or not, they're probably not um, either reach out to Jim or, uh, reach out to us and we'll answer those questions. And, and, you know, it's not a race. You don't want to have buyer's remorse. And that's the worst feeling. You're not buying a pair of tennis shoes, right? You're buying probably the biggest investment in your life. And you really need to get all the facts for your situation so that you can make, a, a, you know, a, an expert 100% confident when you go to bed at night and you lay your head down on the pillow that you've made the right decision. So we're all about educating. And uh, then the next thing is, is the timing right for you? Stronger than strong, cooler than ice. It's the highest and the very best.